So welcome back to the third day of uh, the eighth session of Geometry and Tacos. Today, we're very happy to have Mario Garcia Fernandez from Madrid. Uh, and Mario will tell us about uh, non-Kaler Clavial geometry and pluriclosed flow. So thank you very much for your classes, for, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be in this uh, new round of, of geometry and, and tacos. I think it's, it's a great idea and, and it's, I think it's also a good idea to, to have it uh, asynchronous and recorded. It's nice to have this interaction with, with the audience. So uh, any questions you have, any time you, you want to ask something, please interrupt me. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some joint work with Josh Jordan and, and Jeff Streets, which appeared on the archive about one year ago. And it's about this non calabria geometry and, and pretty close flow. Okay, so let me start with some motivation, uh, talking about the, the, the story of for keller rich flow, which is kind of well known to possibly to many of you. So we have a, a complex manifold, which is going to be to n real dimensional or n complex dimensional. And then in this complex manifold, I'm going to say that I have a, a Keller metric. If I have a Riemannian metric G, which satisfies the following. So J is the almost complex structure in the complex manifold. And then this metric has to be Hermitian. So J needs to be ortho orthogonal at each point. And furthermore, uh, the the almost complex structure needs to be parallel with respect to the levy chivita condition. And then there is this uh, kind of classical calculation which tells you that actually having uh, nabla j equals to zero is equivalent to the Hermitian form omega, which we are going to call the Keller form, which is a one one form with respect to the complex structure. This is equivalent to being uh, um, to the omega being in zero. Since I'm assuming that my complex, almost complex structure is actually integrable, then I, I don't see the niche hoist tensor. Otherwise, if I start with some uh, UN structure, then I will see also the vanishing of the niche hoist tensor in this, in this remark. Then uh, I will say that a uh, one parameter family of Keller metrics, which I'm going to identify with the associated Keller forms, is a solution of the keller ricci flow if the variation with respect to time of the of the Keller form is minus the Ricci the Ricci form. Okay, so what is this Ricci form? So I'm pretty sure you know what is the, the Ricci tensor. So the Ricci form is just uh, calculated. This is a two form, it's actually of type one one, and it's calculated by taking the Ricci tensor and rotating by J, so this formula here, okay? And it's very similar to what happens with, or to the relationship that you have between the, element, the metric and the, and the Hermitian form of the Keller form. And locally, this Ricci form has a nice formula because it can be alternatively thought of as the curvature of a churn connection in the canonical bundle or anti-canonical bundle. And this local formula is I, D bar D of log of the determinant of the metric in holomorphic coordinates. In particular, due to this formula, there is nothing one has to prove, but in particular, we observe that the Hermitian form omega T, the Keller form, is evolving locally by something which is the D bar closed, so in particular is D closed. And therefore, the Keller Ricci flow is going to preserve the Keller condition. And taking this equation here and rotating by J, which is fixed. It's going to tell me that, in particular, I'm going to have a, a, a solution of, of Ricci flow. Okay. And there is this factor of two, which appears when you take uh, when you consider this from the point of view of complex geometry, but it doesn't matter. It just amounts to to rescale time. <laughs> okay. So what what do we know about the uh, existence for this flow? Well, this is a, a classical result from the 80s due to Hamilton and Shaw. So if you have a compact Keller manifold, then the Keller Ricci flow has with, um, with some background uh, Keller metric, then the Keller Ricci flow with initial condition omega naught has a unique solution for some time interval for some t 
capital T bigger than zero in, in this interval zero t. Okay, so at least the short time existence of the, of the flow is, is granted by this term. And therefore, this is a well posed uh, problem. Okay, so given any, any initial condition on a compact uh, Keller manifold, I can, I can flow for a little amount of time. Okay, so what, what about long time existence and convergence when there is this famous theorem by Sao from the 85, which tells you that okay, not in any uh, Keller manifold, but if we assume that our compact Keller manifold furthermore satisfies that the first chain class is zero, then for any initial Keller metric omega naught, the Keller Ricci flow is going to exist for all time. And furthermore, it's going to converge smoothly to some omega infinity, which satisfies the following. Firstly, since we are assuming that the first chain class is zero, uh, the evolution of the Keller class is zero as well. So the Keller class remains constant. Okay, we have this. So the, the Keller class will evolve in principle by a multiple of the, of the first chain class. Since we are assuming zero, then the final metric, the limit metric, has the same Keller class. And furthermore, uh, since an, in the limit we obtain this stationary solution, then we are going to have that the, that the bismuth, sorry, that the Ricci tensor is zero for the Keller metric. Okay. And this is a, a super nice result because, in particular, uh, Sao at the time recovered a Jaus theorem for Calabian metrics. Okay. So, whenever you have a compact Keller manifold with vanishing first chain class, this tells you that in any Keller class there exists. Uh, a Keller Ricci flat metric. Or good, any questions? So the main point of my talk is how can we extend this to the case of non-Keller Calabio manifolds? Okay, so what happens in, in the case that my manifold, my complex manifold is compact but non-Keller? Okay, and for me, well, Calabio means many things for many people, and for me, it's just going to mean that the first chain class vanishes in the rank commodity. Okay. I'm going to take this simple, this simple definition of, of Calabria. Okay, so what is non-Keller? Well, we heard about this uh, in previous talk by Daniele and, and Jorge, but let me let me recall. So so non-Keller here I mean that it does it does not admit a Keller metric. Okay. And let me give you some examples. So by by the known classification of of compact complex surfaces, any compact complex surface uh, with a first value number odd doesn't have a Keller metric. Okay. And actually, it's, a, it's an if and only. So, let me give you some, some more concrete examples. So, this is a diagonal Hopf surface. You take your complex manifold to be C2 minus the origin quotient by a radial action of Z. Which is acting by this. So you take n in Z, and this acts on Z, Z1, Z2. These are complex coordinates in C2 by rescaling. Okay. Then, if you think of what C2 minus the origin is, C2 minus the origin is like a three sphere cross uh, positive R. So since I'm quotienting uh, by a radial set action, I'm compactifying the, the, the R direction. So in the end, I get with. I end up with a S3 cross S1. Okay. And this manifold, firstly, has first betting number equals to one. So by this general theorem, we know it's non-Keller. But furthermore, here we can see it very explicitly because there is no second cohomology. Okay. So there is no second cohomology. Therefore, if it were, if there were a Keller metric in my in my manifold, then there should be a non-vanishing Keller class. Okay. And this is not the case. The, the Keller class will be the, the class of the of the of the Keller form. For that metric. Okay, so let me give you another example. Now in dimension three, this was in dimension two. So non-Keller manifolds exist in any in any dimension. But for example, if you take uh, the group manifold SU two cross SU two, then you can take an integrable left invariant complex structure, and then okay, SU two is is isomorphic, diffeomorphic to S3. So you, the manifold is, is diffeomorphic to S3 cross S3. And in particular, the second betting number is zero. And again, this cannot be K. OK. So these are two, two examples very explicit that you can think of. OK, so in order to, 
to have a, a, an analog of this uh, thrown by sow in, in, in the non keller setup, one needs a definition of, of some geometric flow. There are various candidates in the interior literature. Many people have worked on, on this. So for example, there are the, this family of formation curvature flow by Streets, Tiana, and Justinovsky. The chain rigid flow is studied by Gil, Rosati, and Moinkov, and many other people, these people who introduced this thing. And then the anomaly flows introduced by Fong, Picard, and Sang, the balance flow by Beduli and Betsoni, and yeah, possibly others, which I have not collected in this, in this short list. Okay, so if I didn't mention you, yes, my apologies. So in, in this talk, I'm going to focus on a particular instance of the Hormesian curvature flows introduced by Street, Stian, and, and Justinowski. And this particular flow is called the, the pluriclose flow. Okay. So now I'm going to focus on the, on the pluriclose flow. And the idea or the, the goal of the talk is to be able to say something similar to South theorem in the non-killer setup using particular flow, and also to identify the difficulties and the obstructions to have a, I don't know, of this from my, my okay, So let me start with, with the definition. So when I fix my complex manifold of complex dimension N, then I'm going to say that a Riemannian metric G is pretty close if firstly, it is Hermitian. So again, the almost complex structure associated to the complex manifold needs to be orthogonal. And furthermore, it is DD bar closed now. Okay, so before in the Keller setup, I had that the Hermitian form was D closed. And now I'm going to require this weaker condition. So this is weaker because this is DDC of omega or DCD of omega. Okay. And again, this is the Hermitian form or the Keller form. So I just rotate the metric with respect to J. G is symmetric. Since J, since J is orthogonal, this gives me a uh, one one four. Okay, so what does what are the what is the meaning of these conditions appearing in pretty close geometry? Well, I guess the most interesting condition is this thing here, right? That you have to think of as some a linear integrability condition for the for the metric replacing the Keller condition. This is probably the best way of thinking of it. So we have we have a weakened the Keller condition so that hopefully it, this type of metrics are live in a, in a more general class of, of compact. And actually this is the case because by a theorem of evolution, any compact complex surface admits a pretty close metrics, a pretty close metric. And we have seen in the previous slides that for example, hop surfaces do not admit a Keller metrics. So we, we have, a, by considering these pretty close metrics, we, we get a, a rather general class of, 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 of Hermitian metrics, which at least live on any compact complex surface. Okay? There are in higher dimensions, there are obstructions for this. But let me, let me just stick to this there. So another thing you can ask about these pretty closed uh, metrics is what are the local degrees of freedom of the metric? So if, if I have a, a Keller metric by the DD bar lemma, we know that this metric is going to be DD bar of a function. But now, uh, if I have a pluriclose metric, what happens is that locally, uh, this admits a local potential, which is a one zero form. So it, what, what I mean is that my Hermitian form can be written as T bar of alpha plus tail of alpha conjugate or some one zero, okay? This, what this is telling you is that whatever canonical geometry we want to study using pluriclose metrics is going to be much more complicated than in the Keller setup because in the Keller geometry, one of the, the wonders of Keller geometry, one of the nice features of Keller geometry is whatever PDE I have for the curvature, it reduces to a PDE for a function if I fix the Keller class. And in here, the PDE is going to be for, for a one zero form. Okay, so it's, it's going to be more, more complex. And let me give you one particular example. So there is this booth by metric on, on the on the half surface. So here I write it in the in the universal cover. And it's just the flat metric rescaled by the, the radius squared in when you identify this with R4. This metric is non-keller, 
precisely because you are rescaling by this function, but you can actually check that this is uh, this is pretty close. So essentially, if you take a here DDC, what you get is the Laplacian of one over R squared, and and this is a delta located at the at the origin. Okay, so in C two minus the origin is zero. So with these uh, preliminaries, we can introduce the, the pluricloss flow. So this was defined first by Santiani in 2010. And we say that a one parameter family of pluricloss metrics is a solution to pluricloss flow if the following formula is, is satisfied. Okay, so the, the formula doesn't look very nice, but let me try to explain. So if you, if you evolve your metric respect to time, then the time derivative needs to be equal to minus del, del star of omega, where this is the adjoint for the del operator with respect to the metric, minus d bar d star of omega, d, sorry, d bar d, d bar star of omega, minus this thing that looks familiar because I introduced before. So this is this is really a local formula, right? And what this is is the the churn ricci form for the Hamilton metric. Okay, so why why this uh, equation when at least there is something nice about this thing, which is that it preserves for sure the pluriclose condition, right? So in if we have a pluriclose uh, metric, uh, then if I evolve in this way, since I'm taking del and I'm, I'm saying that the time derivative is del of something plus d bar of something plus d bar of something, if I take d bar of this on the right hand side, then it's going to be so morally, this is the reason why this is nice. This is a, a nice equation. So it, Street Santiam proved in 2010 in their paper that this was a, a well-posed problem. So for any initial pretty close metric, you can find a solution for a small time. And also one can prove that if the, your initial data is scalar, then this reduces to, to scalar rigid flow. Essentially, if your initial data is scalar, and these two terms are going to, to vanish. And then you were going, we end up with, with these things. Okay, so so far this doesn't look very, very nice, say, because it doesn't, I mean, there is no geometric reason for introducing this, this bunch of terms. But actually, there is a more a more conceptual way of thinking about this flow in terms of Riemannian geometry. So I have this uh, pretty close flow. And now I'm going to see it from the eyes of the metric, of the remaining metric, forgetting about the fact that I have a obstruction. So suppose that, that the, I have a solution to particular flow, then it's street and, and the proof. Then if I take the corresponding metric, the corresponding torsion, which is defined by minus dc of omega t, this is the obstruction for being killer. And the associated leaf form, which is given by this formula. So whenever I have a a uh, Hermitian structure on a manifold, I can calculate a one form, which is given by d star of omega and then rotating by j. And so I have my solution to particular flow. I calculate these quantities, the metric, this three form torsion, and the leaf form, and then the flow line is going to satisfy these equations. Okay, so we started just with a with a Hermitian form satisfying this thing, and now we find out that actually this, this is a solution of this coupled flow. So what is this quantity here? Well, the evolution of the metric is minus Ricci. This is the usual Ricci tensor. Plus this is the unique symmetric tensor that I can cook up out of this three form by contracting indices. Then you have this lead derivative of the dual of the, of the one form uh, of the lead form with respect to the metric. And then this other evolution which tells you that the evolution of the free form is almost by the Laplacian. So it's almost satisfying the, the heat flow, but by a correction coming precisely by the leaf form. So what this tells you is that if you pull back by the leaf form and the flow line in particular, these two terms are going to drop. And then the free form is going to evolve by, by, this, uh, by this heat equation. And then you're going to have some deformation of, of Ricci flow. So what, does, what is this? Or what is the meaning of these equations? Well, actually, these are very nice equations. They make sense in the in the context of, of generalized geometry, if you know what this is. It was studied by 
by Streets in this nice paper from 2008. And then um, last year, we, we finished a book about this that was published in this lecture series of the AMS. If you're curious about this, this flow from the purely remaining point of view, you can, you can take a look at the book and look for more details. Okay, so what is the meaning of these equations rather besides the fact that they are natural in, in the context of general geometry? Well, this, these equations are very natural because they appear in physics. Okay, so if, if you formally take these equations which are satisfied by the remaining metric, the leaf form and the, and the free form transition, and now you formally assume that your leaf form is, is gradient, so it's the gradient of a function which may evolve in time, then what you find is something that this is called the renormalization group flow in, in a string theory. And this is given by this formula here. So the, the idea in the physical literature is that you have some background geometry for, for with your strings uh, 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 where your strings are, should propagate. And then if you, if you want to have a, a nice theory, you should flow your, your background fields, which are the metric, the torsion, and the function. You should flow them to via this flow uh, in order to have a, a nice, a nice uh, quantum, quantum theory. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, any questions about this? So if not, let me let me go for for the following. So uh, I have told you that this is a very natural flow because it uh, firstly it links to general geometry, also to physics. But if we want to understand it purely in terms of formation geometry, there is also something that we can do, which is to consider the bismuth connection. So given a pretty close Hermitian metric, more generally any Hermitian metric, one can associate a connection, which is this one here, is the levi Civita minus, you raise one index with the metric of DC of omega of the torsion. And this, this connection is unitary, meaning that it preserves both the metric and the comp structure. Okay. And then using this connection, one can alternatively write the particular flow as this evolution equation. So the evolution of, of the Hermitian form is minus the one one part of the bismuth Ricci form. So what is the bismuth Ricci form? So I told you the bismuth connection is unitary, it's Hermitian. So you can induce a connection, a Hermitian connection on the canonical bundle or the anti-canonical bundle. And then you can take the curvature of that. And this is the form, okay? It's calculated in terms of the of the classical uh, tensor, uh, curvature tensor for the, for the bismuth connection in terms of the, of the tangent path. Okay, so this is, this is more, for complex geometries, but this is more natural because of course, in non kähler geometry, you have several choices for unitary connections that you can, that one can choose because the churn connection and the levitz beta connection are not equal. And this is one, one natural choice for, for evolving the metric. And for the applications, maybe I'm not sure how, how much time I'm going to have for that, but for the, for the results, for the proofs of what, what I'm going to tell you next, it is important that you couple this flow to zero. Okay, so since this is evolving by a, by a one one form, by the one one bar, the, the one one bit of the bismuth Ricci form, then one can introduce in an ad hoc way a priori a two zero form, which is also evolving in time, which keeps track of the two zero bit of the of the bismuth Ricci form. Okay. And then you can evolve by this. And if you remember what I had in the previous slide about these generalized uh, Ricci flow equations, which appear in, in physics, then the evolution of the real part of this two zero form is precisely by the other bit in the equations in this couple flow, which was evolving the metric, the three form, and the and the leaf. Okay. Okay, good. So with this in hand, then I can introduce the, the questions that I wanted to address for particular flow. So I, I told you that I wanted an analog of South theorem in in the context of non kähler geometry. So what is the what what is the analog of South theorem if we specify to pluricloss flow? 
So the first question, which is, as you will see, is, is a bit naive, is uh, if you have a compact complex manifold with vanishing uh, uh, first in class, does the pretty close flow admit a global, admit global existence and convergence to a pretty close to a pretty close metric with vanishing bismuth Ricci form? And of course, in in South Serum, we have arbitrary initial data, and this is what we what we aim for. Okay, okay so this is literally copying and pasting South Serum, and then uh, just replacing keller ricci flow by pretty close flow. Well, the, the answer to this question is no. It's only no. And there are examples where this doesn't happen. The, uh, the first examples are due to streets in, in compact complex surfaces. And the geometry is of a T2, T2 bundle over a high genus surface. So streets, Jeff uh, Streets proves that in this situation for a suitable choice of, of initial of initial pluriclose metric, then the geometry is going to collapse the fibers and converge to the to the hyperbolic metric in the in the base. Okay, so this is not this is not a reproducing what we observe in the in the case of of South Serum for Keller for Keller Ricci. Okay, let, since this doesn't work, let me be more brutal and put more more stronger constraints on, on the geometry. So assume that. You have now a compact complex manifold with vanishing first in class. And let's assume that we have a, a bismuth flat pretty close metric. So a pretty close metric, but the, the bismuth connection is, is flat. Okay, there is no curvature. Then I can ask the same question. Does pretty close flow admit global existence and convergence to, to a flat pretty close metric, maybe different from the initial one for arbitrary initial pretty close uh, metric omega nodes? Okay, so I start with bismuth flat and I wonder if I convert to, to bismuth flat for any initial data. And if you, if this is, this is rather a recent result, but if you, if you um, ask yourselves about what is the geometry of these bismuth flat manifolds, there is this theorem by Wang, Yang, and Seng from 2016, which tells you that up to covers a compact bismuth flat uh, Hermitian manifold. Uh, is of the form G times TK, so G times a torus, where G is a compact semi-simple Lie group, and G is a invariant metric in this in this product of, of groups. Okay, and also the the, the complex structure needs to be left in mind. Okay, so it's, it's the geometries we are considering by this bismuth Ricci flat, bismuth flat uh, uh, connections are pretty constrained and essentially have to cover their products of of Lie groups. Okay. So let's let's try to understand what what is this question to them in this situation. And even more concrete, let me mention this this question by Streets in in a conference about geometry and physics in 2017. So before um, about this this time, five years ago there was very little known about pretty close flow, and in particular if you fix the 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 half surface. Uh, as before, just by the diagonal action, so a diagonal half surface, then it was not known whether the particular flow admit global existence and, and convergence to a multiple of this particular metric for an arbitrary initial pretty close metric omega node. Okay? So if your initial, if you identify this with, um, with the group U1 crosses U2, and your initial data is left invariant, then uh, in some cases, you can prove this by hand by reducing to an ODE, but in the general case of, of arbitrary initial pretty close metric omega naught, this was not known five years ago. Okay, so any any questions? These are the 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 questions I I, I would like to address. Okay, so if there are no questions, then let me go for the for the results. So the first result I want to mention is related to the first question. So recall that I told you that uh, the naive question produced by copying and pasting South Serum and replacing keller ricci flow by pretty close flow doesn't work. And it's, we, we know that be, because of these results by Jeff Streets, but actually can we find a conceptual reason for that? And surprisingly, the conceptual reason for that comes from geometric invariant theory. 
in algebraic geometry. So this is hidden in the proof of this theorem, but actually this gives you a clean obstruction for, for the existence of, of a pretty close matrix with vanishing bismuth Ricci form. So what the, what the theorem states, this is joint work with uh, George Jordan and Jeff Streets, is that if you suppose you have a holomorphic map between two compact complex manifolds from N to Z, assume that Z is scalar and has negative first chain class. As in, this, as in the examples by streets, recall that in the examples by streets, you had this T2 bundle over a Riemann surface of hygiene. And assume further that DF is surjective at one point. Then MG does not admit a pretty close metric with vanishing bismuth Ricci form. So, okay, so the, in particular, the, the analog of, of South theorem cannot be true because we don't have what we expect in the, in the limit. Okay? The limit doesn't exist in this. So this provides a, an obstruction to, to convergence in question one. And here is a very concrete example. So if you take a degree five hypersurface in P3, and then you take a holomorphic principle T2 bundle over Z, given by this choice of first chain classes, then uh, here I have chosen the first chain class of Z so that the, the total space has vanished in first chain class. Okay. And then one can suitably choose alpha, the other class, so that MJ is pretty close. And this satisfies all the hypotheses of my theorem. So these geometries do not carry. These are three folds. And these three folds do not carry any, any solutions to, to pretty close plus bismuth Ricci form hypothesis. And, and besides taking uh, products with the results that was with the, the examples that found by streets, it was an open question whether in higher dimensions there were any obstructions to, to this geometry. Okay, this is first. A quick first question. Thing. Those three folds, uh, they, they don't have trivial canonical bundle, do they? Just C1? No, 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 no. Right. No, no. Okay. It's only vanishing first in class. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, if you have a holomorphic volume form, this automatically obstructs this thing. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it should be Kaler. Yeah, if, the, if there is a holomorphic volume form. Yeah, if, it is a, if, if there Kaler is a holomorphic volume form, yeah. you have pretty close um, vanishing bismuth Ricci form, then automatically you have Kaler. I see, okay. I see. So, so, this so is, these examples only, so C1 is zero, but not trivial. Not holomorphic. For. Okay, I see. Right. This is by a classical result by evolution. Okay, so the second theorem I wanted to, to comment on is also doing work with the streets and Jordan. So if we have a compact complex non killer surface with quadrilateral dimension non-negative, then given any pretty close metric omega naught, the pretty close flow with this initial condition exists for all time. So we, we cannot prove a convergence, but at least we know that it exists for all time. Okay, and for, for quadrilateral dimension equals to one, then these are precisely these T2 bundles over over hygienous Riemann surfaces, which were studied in the paper by Spitz. But here, I mean, in, in, the, in the paper by Jeff, he was assuming that the initial condition was, it had a T2 symmetry. And here we can prove it for arbitrary initial, initial case. And then the third, the third result that I wanted to, to comment on is, so, so join work with Jordan and Stris in the same in the same preprint, and is the following. So assume that you have a compact. It's related to question three about bismuth Ricci flat about bismuth flat manifold. Sorry, and it says the following. So assume that you have a compact complex manifold with vanishing first chain class, and assume that you carry this geometry carries a bismuth flat pretty close metric that I'm going to denote omega f. Then given other pretty close metric, omega naught, satisfying this condition in cohomology. So both omega naught and omega f are DD bar closed. So if I take del of them, this is D bar closed, right? And this defines a, con, uh, a class, a well-defined class in, in double cohomology. So if these two classes agree, then the pretty close flow with initial condition omega naught exists for all time and convergence to a bismuth flat pretty close metric omega infinity. And this omega infinity may be different from the, big end, from the given omega f, okay? So the, 
if I have time to comment on briefly on the proof, you will see that all I need is to have this background, background bismuth flat uh, metric. But I, 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 don't, I don't have really control on where the limit goes. Okay, but this is very nice because we have reduced question two about convergence, long time existence and convergence of free close flow on, on bismuth flat uh, manifolds to some cohomological condition, which is this, this thing here for arbitrary initial, initial take. And as a corollary, we saw this simple, I mean, apparently, or a pretty simple question on the half surface, which is uh, if I run the particular flow on the on the half surface with arbitrary initial data, does this converges to a to a multiple of the boot metric? And actually, this is true. And the reason, or the the reason why we can prove this thing is because in which just by application of the previous term, so a, a half surface is, is bismuth flat, and in, on a half surface, the relevant cohomology groups are pretty simple. So the the one the ball cohomology is, is one, and we can reduce everything to to the previous term. Okay, so this is the, the idea. Okay, so I think I have seven minutes left. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. If so, then let me try to. Okay, are there any questions about the, the statements? So, if not, let, let me give you a hint on the proof. Okay, I, I chose I've chosen one term, which is this, the one about bismuth flat, and I'm just going to comment on on that term. Okay, because this is a this is a, a taco session about geometric flow, so let me just comment on this term for the bismuth flat. Okay, so what, what do you do? And, and the proof is nice. It, it involves some ingredients from coming from generalized geometry and also from, from bundles. So say that you have a 214 on your complex manifold, which is D bar closed. If this is the case, then you can construct a holomorphic vector bundle, which is as a smooth bundle, it's just tangent one zero plus tangent one zero dual, so tangent plus cotangent, holomorphic sense. But it doesn't carry the useful holomorphic structure. It carries this twisted holomorphic structure. Okay. And you use tau to twist the double operator. So what this means is that as a holomorphic vector bundle, it fits into an extension. It's not a split, but it fits into an extension. This is Q tau. The holomorphic cotangent fits into Q, it's a Q tau. And then this goes to, to tangent on zero and then to zero. Okay. So we have this twisted bundle. And now given a Hermitian form, little omega on my complex manifold and some two zero form, I can define a Hermitian metric on this Q tau given by this formula. So what I do is to take in tangent plus cotangent, I take the diagonal metric induced by the Hermitian metric. So G in the tangent directions, G inverse in the cotangent directions. And I push it forward by this quantity, which is, I mean, people call this B, B field transformation. And it's a natural, Transformation in tangent plus cotangent. So it's the identity on sorry, it's the identity on the cotangent, and then elements in the tangent are are sent to the same plus beta contracted with the vector. Okay. And this is the form, it's very explicit. Okay, so I'm going to consider this class of formation metrics. And this is the key. So given one of these formation metrics associated to little omega and beta. I'm going to denote by FG the churn curvature of this metric in this twisted bundle. Okay, I have a twisted bundle with some tau, and this has some churn curvature. And then I can I can calculate some people call this the, the, the second Ricci form. Okay, you trace the churn curvature with omega to the n minus one. And notice that this quantity is coupled, is very coupled, because I'm using little omega for both constructing the big metric on tangent plus cotangent, but also for tracing. Okay, so this quantity is, is not, is not a, the, the little omega also enters into the definition of, of the of the curvature. So assume now, this is what the, the proposition tells us, assume now that we have this, this condition here, which <clears throat> is telling us that a del of omega naught and del of tau live in the same Dolbo homology class. 
So assume that this condition is satisfied. Sorry, del of omega naught and tau live in the same cohomology, the Bo cohomology. Provided that this condition is satisfied, then a one parameter family of omegas and, and betas uh, with this initial condition satisfies the pluricular flow. This extension that I mentioned before, where you enhance the original pluricular flow by flowing also beta by the two zero part of the, of the bismuth Ricci form. Then if this satisfies pluricular flow, this flow here, then the big G satisfies this, uh, this equation here. So what is this? This is formally, this is like Donaldson flow or Hermitian matrix on a holomorphic vector bundle. But I, again, I, I tell you that one has to be very, uh, very careful with this because SG omega depends in two ways on the Hermitian form. It depends on the definition of G itself, but also when I take traces, okay? So this is like Donaldson flow, but with a further coupling. Okay, so let me comment on this condition. This condition here tells you that uh, del of omega naught and tau are uh, living the same cohomology class. Okay, and what this tells you is that you can relate two holomorphic ghetto bundles. The one, the, this twisted holomorphic ghetto bundle corresponding to tau that I introduced at the beginning, and the one corresponding to del omega naught. Okay, and, and what I'm doing to construct this G metric is to push forward via this beta transformation, which is now holomorphic, the diagonal metric on the Q defined by del omega naught. So that's the the proof of this magic proposition is uh, something which we call the bismuth identity because it's, it's somehow hidden in a, in a classical and beautiful paper by bismuth about the, the index, the index uh, theorem for, for the Dirac operators of, of our Hermitian manifolds. And it's, it's essentially, I mean, not this evolution equation, but at least the formula for, for this uh, or the relationship between this second Ricci form of the churn of the churn curvature and the bismuth Ricci form. That's the key. Okay. There is a relationship between this quantity on the right hand side and the bismuth Ricci form, which makes this possible. Okay, so in the last one minute, maybe I can say something. So once you have this thing, then if you have a solution of curricular flow with this condition, then you can prove that for any background. Or mission metric on this twisted bundle, one has this nice evolution equation of the trace of the metric GT with respect to some background metric, whatever it is. Okay. So this is the, the heat operator acting on this trace of GT with respect to GT. There is this non-positive quantity which keeps track of the difference, the normal square of the differences of the of the churn connections. And then this junk, which has to do with the with a second Ricci form of uh, the background metric G tilde with respect to omega. And here, here is the key. And I'm not going to, to say more because I'm running out of time, but this is say the key, the key idea for the proof is that if you if you have now in your manifold a background metric which is bismuth flat, then you can use this metric to produce a G tilde on your Q tau, okay? And then you can use this background metric to calculate this formula and this drops in this formula. And then you get that this quantity, trace of G tilde with respect to the background metric uh, is, is non-positive, okay? So the, sorry, the, the heat operator acting on this is non-positive and then you can apply the, the maximum principle to get the estimates in order to, to prove the, the, long time, the long time existence and convergence for, for the flow. Okay, but this is the, the key idea. That the, the, key, the key observation in order to prove this thing is that bismuth curvature in the, in, the, in the usual sense for a metric on a manifold is translated into churn curvature by twisting tangent plus cotangent in the way uh, I, I mentioned in, in, the, in the previous slide. Okay, so I, I'm not going to say anything more because I'm running out of time. So thank you for, for your attention.